are a meetup group for people who design and build APIs. Um, thank you for coming. So the topics we usually discuss during our meetups include API design and best practices, the API development process from specification to development, testing, and so on, the business of APIs, the future direction and te technologies uh, that's related to APIs, and yep, that's it. This is our second meetup. We had our first meetup last year, and I think that was pretty awesome, and this, I hope this will be pretty cool as well. Um, today we have an interesting uh, set of topics um, by three speakers. First is uh, Jos, uh, who will be sharing on Beyond JSON, exploring different uh, serialization formats. And then we have uh, Gao Xiang, uh, who will be sharing on API gateways and microservices. Then we have Pei Song, who will be sharing about APIs with domain-driven design. Um, yep. So without further ado, let's start with our first speaker. Uh, I'm the first speaker. So hi everyone, I'm Yoss. Um, I'm a software engineer working at a company called BandLab. We're a music startup. Uh, and today I'd like to share with you Beyond JSON, um, or fantastic serialization formats and where to find them. And so over the course of uh, preparing for this talk, I realized that serial serialization sounds awfully similar to serialization. You, you see that? Yes. <laughs> So I'll be using a lot of serial-related examples uh, for this talk. So uh, for the benefit of those of us who might not be familiar with uh, APIs, I'm just going to start with some introduction about what a web API is and what exactly we're talking about. So first of all, a web API is a basically like a website for your software. Uh, it lets software communicate with each other over the network or the internet. And my talk will be covering about alternative serialization formats. And Serialization is a key step in this software-to-software -software communication process. Uh, it answers the question of what medium do we, do, does the system communicate with? What language does the systems communicate with? So examples of web APIs, I think you, all of us are familiar with Login with Facebook. Uh, Login with Facebook is essentially calling Facebook's API, Facebook's website, to communicate with Facebook's underlying authentication system. Uh, other APIs include uh, third-party services like Twilio, which is an SMS communication API, Stripe, which is a payment API, and HelloSign is an electronic signatures API. And there are also services that allow APIs to communicate with each other. For example, IFTT lets you, IFTT is short for, for, short for if this, then that. It lets you trigger, for example, if you receive an email, it would trigger something else, maybe uh, an SMS using Twilio's API, a charge using the Stripe API or something else. It wires up different APIs together to communicate and create uh, actions that are triggered using APIs. And Zapier is kind of similar. Both are third-party services that utilizes APIs to build new things. So this is the structure of my talk. Uh, I'll be starting with an, a brief introduction to serialization, what, what serialization is. Uh, I'll be talking about JSON, which is the most common format of today's APIs, followed by message pack and protocol buffers. And finally, uh, have a conclusion. And that's serial. Yeah. So, okay. So serialization, what is that? Anyone have an idea? Seri serialization. Okay. <laughs> so serialization is the process of translating, translating object state, could be a row in your database, into a format that can be transmitted and reconstructed later. So one analogy is like uh, you have a letter and you want to, to send it somewhere, to someone else, so you put it in an envelope and you send it over the wire, someone opens the envelope and retrieves 
the state, the message inside. So another analogy is you have a bowl of cereal. Um, you put it in the box and you send it to someone, and that someone just opens the box and pour, just eat the cereal. So for APIs, communication between systems is key. Uh, so the main use case for serialization is to transfer data between different systems. This is because systems might be implemented in different languages. For example, you have a Ruby API, a Node API. They might have different data types, different ways of represent, to represent strings. And to communicate with each other, they need some kind of shared language that they agreed upon a priori at the beginning that uh, they agreed to be uh, the language that they're using. So for example, most of, some of us here might be bilingual. We speak English, but maybe we speak a different language. But for the sake of this meetup, I'm speaking to you in English. It's like a shared language we both have and we both understand. So serialization formats is that shared language. So this is an example. You have different software systems written in different platforms, different languages. They have their own way of encoding data types. So to communicate between each other, they need to somehow translate the data, tape, the data types in their own language to another language. Um, but the problem with this is that for every pair, you need to have some kind of integration or some kind of uh, middle layer to handle that translation. So instead of doing this, we use some kind of common data serialization format that, we, that the systems agree to speak. And so this is what we'll be looking at, different data serialization formats. So the most common is JSON. So your Ruby API return a JSON response, and you consume JSON. It's the de facto serialization format of the web. And so in this talk, we'll be looking at three different formats, JSON, message pack, and protocol buffers. So in looking at these three formats, we will evaluate uh, a few key attributes. One is, how readable is it are the formats? Does it spot types, validation? Does it spot schema evolution? And, and so on. Uh, we'll revisit these few attributes when we look at the three formats. And with that, let's start with JSON. So JSON is today's standard way of uh, standard serialization format. It's easy to pass. It's easy to generate and read. It's human readable. Uh, but the drawback is it has no schema and no type checking. Um, to sum up, it's easy to work with, but not very efficient with the wire. It also, also has no schemas. So this is what JSON looks like. Uh, it's based on JavaScript. It's an object with keys and attributes. And yeah, this is JSON. It looks like this. Um, so I think of JSON compared to the other two formats as like a postcard. You don't need an envelope. You can just send it as is. You need, and it's, it, can be read, it can be read by the browser natively. So but the drawback of using uh, plain old JSON is that it has no types. So the types of JSON are limited to those things. But beyond that, uh, for example, uh, data types that might be available in statically typed languages like enums, for example, we cannot represent that natively with JSON. So some features of some types are lost in translation somehow. And because JSON is dynamically typed, if you want to validate the format, the shape of the messages, we have to do it by writing code. Like for example, if this attribute exists, or if this attribute is an integer or a Boolean. So these things have to be written down in actual code rather than having a kind of schema or type to validate this automatically. So to check if a required attribute exists, if check the types of an attribute and other validations, this has to be done in actual code. So that's not nice. So, and I realized that, uh, have, have anyone heard of JSON schema? JSON schema, yes. So this does exist, and 
this does uh, JSON schema. It's okay, so JSON schema is uh, a way to um, describe the shape of your JSON messages and validate them. So, for example, we might be sending. So this is an example of a JSON uh, message. So maybe you could say that, hey, this mess these messages I'm sending have a first name that is a string, a last name is a string, and other attributes. We can specify a format that we can then use to validate without having to write code to check manually every single message. Uh, but this is not perfect. And as we'll see, other serialization formats have a more expressive way to solve this issue than JSON schema. Any questions at this point? Okay, thank you. So next we'll look at message pack. Have, how many of you have used match, message pack? Of, oh, cool. What do you use it for? Uh, I use the message pack to serialize the object and store in Redis. Ah, yeah. It's a common use case for that. Yeah, thanks. So message pack. Uh, so Data. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It has an efficient binary encoding, meaning you can compact it very well. It takes, first of all, it's not human readable. It's smaller, it takes less space, and as a result, you can cut your client server exchange traffic because the messages are smaller. And it has uh, schemas and types, but we won't go into that uh, in this talk. And the key strength of message pack is that it's useful for systems that require low latency and high throughput, and it's also used in storage, in reducing the amount of storage that you need uh, to store your data. Um, in real life use, it's used for real time games and systems that really need that low latency and high throughput. And it can very easily be a drop in replacement for JSON. If you're already using JSON, to use message pack is like three lines of code. So this is what JSON looks like, and that's what message pack looks like. It's a binary format. Again, it's not human readable, it's not supposed to be but it takes less space. So yeah, in most cases, usually it's around a 50% reduction, but it depends on your use case. So I have a quick demo for message pack. Is it visible? Uh, so okay. So let's say we have a serial object, and let's say we have an API that usually returns JSON, a JSON string, and uh, using message pack, just convert it to a message. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, and that's it, and you send this instead of a JSON string. And then at the other side, to, when you want to consume this message, just, oh, and it just decodes that uh, message pack into a JSON string. So it's just a simple serialization into message packs, into message pack and deserialization back into whatever it was. And it's not limited to JSON. It could be just straight up, uh, for example, it could straight up uh, decode like a Ruby object or any, um, any of the language's data structures. So, so just a side-by-side -side comparison between JSON and message pack. Um, basically, it's, I mean, message pack is, is using some its, its own code. Uh, it's not readable. <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. So that's message pack. So the key idea, the key difference between message pack and JSON is that uh, message pack has this idea of compressing the messages into a different format for efficient transport. So that's the first idea. And next we look at protobuf, which has a couple more interesting ideas. So protocol buffers is, according to Google, a way of encoding structured data in an efficient yet extensible format. So the two key ideas here is struct the three key ideas here is structured, efficient, and extensible. So it's the so for internal services at Google, apparently they don't use JSON. They use protocol buffers for their internal service communication. And it's a compact binary format like message pack, as we've seen. It's also efficient. It compiles a different, smaller, comp uh, more compact version uh, prior to sending over the network. It has schemas, which we'll look at next, and has client generation, um, which we'll also look at next. So this is an example of a, a protocol buffer schema. We call it a proto file. Essentially, this is, uh, describes the shape of your messages that you send between systems. So this person message has three attributes, an ID of an integer format, a name, which is a string, and an email is a string. We have other uh, annotations that describe whether or not uh, these attributes are required for it to be valid. And if you notice, there's like three, um, I don't know what they uh, three numbers. <laughs> Um, and this is, this is used for schema evolution. Essentially, over time, it, you, you'd expect that your system will have um, changes to the messages it sends to each other. And so how do you support that? So we'll take a look at that soon. So the rationale behind protocol buffers is this quote. It says, we carefully craft our data models inside our databases, maintain layers of code to keep these models in check, and then allow all that forethought to fly out of the window when you want to send the, that data over the wire to another service. You might have um, a very carefully written database schema, but when you send it to J to, uh, over the wire using JSON, it just ends up as a string or something else. That's not exactly the schema that you came up with. So, so this is a schema. Um, a key feature of protocol buffers is given a, given a schema, you can generate the client that consumes the messages automatically. For example, given the schema, I just run a CLI uh, command, generates the Java client code that can be used to consume and form messages of this format to other systems, to other services. And uh, And not shown here is the fact that if we didn't, for example, set the ID and then we build it, it would, tr it would throw an error. So, and all that is done automatically by the generated client. The schemas are awesome. Um, it's a very expressive type system. It's not just like required optional. There are other um, type systems like enums, um, composite types. You can define, for example, we define a new type here then use that type in our schema. So it's a pretty expressive system to describe the shape of the data that you're sending between services. So, yeah. so next we look at uh, schema evolution. So m in most cases when we're building systems, we only know something once we start doing it. A few, a few comments later, we might discover that, hey, we're doing this wrong, we shouldn't have this field, or oh, we're missing this field. So we have to add it. But we also have to support existing clients that are already using messages of a particular format. So the challenge here is, can we add new fields or schema over time without breaking old clients? So this is schema evolution. And it's not, this is not available in JSON schema. So this is pretty interesting. Um, so remember the numbers? This is where it's used. So for example, let's say our previous version of our app uses this particular uh, message format as an ID, name, and email. And in our next version of our app, we've changed the schema into this. So you notice, 
for the new field, we, uh, we removed one field and we've added a new field. And we specified a different uh, attribute ID. So with protocol buffers, if, when this happens, the old code will happily read uh, new messages because the email is optional anyway. And to the old code, any optional fields that were deleted in the new schema, we just have a default value or something null. And the new implementation that uses this schema will also just read um, the previous schema, previous uh, messages just fine. I know it's a bit confused. Um, any questions at this point? But if we make it take white for this one of the various things. Sorry? If we make it take white. Yes, OK. Um, think about, so no, it doesn't work like that. You cannot, unfortunately, you cannot delete required attributes. You cannot add new required attributes either. So it's very limited in that sense. Um, yeah, thank you. So, yeah, that's pretty cool. Um, so, <clears throat> just to quickly summarize, when is JSON a good fit? When you want data to be human readable? When the data is consumed directly by the browsers or by JavaScript? You don't need to serialize, you don't need to transform to a different intermediary format. And when it's not important for the data model to be tied to the schema. When should we use message pack? When low latency or when high throughput is key, or when storage considerations, when you want to uh, reduce the amount of storage that you need to store your data. And so both message pack and protocol buffers are only really recommended for internal communication, uh, because anyway, if it's a public API, it's the browser that's consuming it, or some, it's, uh, yeah. And protocol buffers is pretty interesting uh, because you can show structured data and use schemas. And this client generation, uh, given a, set, uh, given a uh, schema, you can just generate a client in any language and platform that is supported by protocol buffers. And also has a somewhat useful feature for ad additive schema evolution. Um, yeah. Yep. Uh, yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, yeah. Yes. Is there a specific uh, reason other than your young age that you didn't look at XML? <laughs> um, um, thank you for addressing the elephant in the room. Um, I think it's. Uh, yeah, I figured it would be. It's close enough to uh, JSON. It's. Um, yeah. Sorry. Actually, I did consider um, looking at other formats like Avro. Uh, I just figured there was not enough time, so thank you. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> thank you. most cases, when people use message pack, they don't even use this. Actually, you can use JSON schema. It's just uh, uh, converting the string into a smaller string and sending it over the wire. So you can definitely use both JSON and message pack at the same time. Would there be use case to use message pack in a browser, or is the uh, serialization uh, tool? I think uh, so. I have seen uh, an implementation using message pack to send state updates for games, for example. You have sent a lot of packets over the wire. And yeah, it's, it's on the browser. So you, you would have that deserialization step in your game client to receive that state update. State update. Is that the question? Yeah, but game clients typically are not. But you mean yes. game client running in the browser? It's a it's a it's a JavaScript. Ah, okay. That's a good. 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 That's
the binary formats are they Indian uh, independent? I just want to make sure. Now you have to explain how the Indian is formed. You're too old for that. <laughs> I can't do that, I'm not a computer science major. <laughs> <laughs> ah, okay, something I should mention is that uh, message pack and protocol buffers have implementations in different languages. And they all satisfy the same unpacking and depacking, uh, unpacking and packing to the same message pack and protocol buffer formats. So, is that, so they, they have a message pack and protocol buffers have clients in multiple languages, and they all follow that same uh, spec. So it should be independent in that sense. Or platform, I, okay, I, I, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you.